Okay, thank you very much uh, for the possibility to speak here and thanks everyone for joining. Um, so <clears throat> today I want to uh, discuss some quantitative mixing properties for infinite measure preserving uh, skew products. And uh, the results I will present today is a joint work with uh, Paolo Giulietti from Scuola Normale Superiore in Italy and Andy Hammelinder from Monash University. So let me start by uh, considering a very specific example. So let's start with the usual cat map on the, acting on the two-dimensional torus T2. And from this, we can uh, construct some partially hyperbolic map just by looking at uh, circle extensions. So we, you fix any sufficiently smooth, smooth map uh, tau from T2 to T, and you define the skew product uh, as the map acting on T2 cross T. Uh, so on the, so the, the skew product factors down on the first coordinate with your original dynamics, so the, the cut map, and on the circle fibers, you act by a translation by the function tau. And these are perhaps the simplest or the prototypical examples of uh, volume preserving partially hyperbolic diffeomorphisms. And um, the ergodic properties have been studied for many years and uh, by many people and now are well understood. Uh, so in this setting, it's known that uh, for a generic set of uh, functions tau, the associated skew product is ergodic and actually it's stably ergodic, so any sufficiently small uh, volume preserving C1 perturbation is again ergodic. Uh, they are mixing and actually much more, uh, they are stably uh, K-automorphisms. So uh, that, that's very good. So in particular, they are mixing. So now we want to ask about some quantitative properties. So can we say how, how, fast, uh, how fast they are mixing? So can we find some bounds on the decay of correlations for these systems. And uh, an important result was, the result was proved by Dolgo Piatti in 2002 uh, in a more general setting, but for these systems, uh, he proved that for a generic set of uh, tau, the associated skew product is uh, rapidly mixing. So namely, it mixes faster than any given polynomial. So if you take any two uh, smooth observables and you fix any positive integer k, then you can find some constant that will depend also on k such that the, the correlations will decay faster than c times n to the minus k. So perhaps it's, uh, one would expect the, the, correlations, the decay of correlations to be exponential, but um, as far as I know, this is still an open question. Um, I will mention that uh, it is known, though, that uh, it, in, in general, it's not faster than exponential. So uh, now the pro proved recently that uh, there are um, exponential lower bounds in general. So even though the cut map itself for analytic uh, observables, it makes it super exponential. Uh, there are uh, uh, extensions and analytic observables for which the decay is uh, not faster than exponential. Uh, anyway, uh, today we want to address a different question. So Dolgo Piat's uh, result holds in general for compact group extension. So here you can replace uh, the fibers, the circle fiber T with any compactly group. Uh, so the, the question I want to address is uh, what happens if you consider instead the non-compact extensions? So in particular, uh, for the moment, we will be interested in seeing what happens for uh, skew products over the cat map where the fibers are R. And before <laughs> doing anything, I actually have to uh, tell you what I mean by mixing because uh, these systems preserve an uh, infinite uh, measure. And, and in infinite ergodic theory, uh, mixing is a delicate issue. And so, so let me take a short uh, uh, digression into uh, mixing in infinite uh, uh, measure preserving system. Uh, so we, we, we know that in the usual finite ergodic theory, uh, mixing amounts to uh, understanding the evolution of uh, initial density. 
So let, let me consider uh, very simple examples. Uh, so the map, uh, the measurable map on the real line T that takes X into X minus one over X. This is known as the bull map, it preserves the Lebesgue measure. So let's see what happens uh, when we take an uh, initial probability density and we evolve it via the dynamics. So if you take, uh, for example, the, the density e to the minus x squared, and you evolve with, uh, with the dynamics, and you, you plot the graph, uh, you see something like this. So uh, although uh, if you plot the graph, the, the maximum of the density will get smaller and smaller, and the mass will spread uh, all over the, the phase phase. So you can convince yourself, and you, you can actually compute, that if you take any continuous function with compact support, and you integrate against the sequence of density, density is in the limit, you will get zero. Uh, no matter what uh, bounded measurable functions with constant support you start with. And, and this, is, this phenomenon happens in many, many cases in, uh, measure, in systems which preserve an infinite measure. So in particular, you can prove that if the system is exact, then for any bounded measurable sets A and B, the correlations will, uh, will go to zero. And this, this property is very weak, and it does not characterize uh, what we would call a mixing behavior, because uh, for example, any translation on R uh, also satisfies this property, but we wouldn't call it uh, we wouldn't call it mixing. So the, the naive uh, transposition of the definition of mixing from finite ergodic theory to infinite ergodic theory uh, is, not a good, uh, is not a good definition. And uh, it has been a subject of uh, debate for many years, what, what is a good uh, definition of mixing. And there have been some, uh, some definitions, and in particular one that is uh, common nowadays and uh, it's, it's kind of well established and uh, well studied for several systems is what is called Krikaber mixing. So you would, uh, you would say that the system is Krikaber mixing if you can find a, a sequence of positive number that converges to infinity um, such that if you take any two measurable sets so if you compute the correlation between the two of them, this would go to zero, but if you rescale them with this sequence that does not depend on the set, if you can prove that uh, this sequence converges to a non-zero limit, then you would say that the system is Krikaber mixing. And uh, you have to restrict yourself to look at only measurable sets of some regularity, so with boundary as zero measure. Uh, so this is one of the possible definition of possible notions of mixing. But uh, today I want to focus on a different one, which uh, is more recent. It was introduced by uh, Marco Lenci in 2010. And uh, essentially the idea, it's called global local mixing. And uh, essentially the idea is, instead of considering correlations between uh, bounded measurable sets, is to look at different classes of observables. So to maybe to clarify what I, what I mean, uh, to go back, one second to the picture I showed before. So in, in this case, if we start from uh, this density here, even if it was uh, very much localized near zero, when I evolve it under the dynamic, the dynamics, what I see are uh, new densities that spread over and, and see uh, larger and larger portions of the phase space. And on these larger and larger portions, uh, they look kind of a uniform, uh, a uniform measure. So you can imagine that if I take a very large n and I integrate the, the, the resulting, the, the, the density at step n against the L infinity function, uh, what I will see is something that is very close to taking the average of my L infinity function over a large box. So this is the idea uh, that the notion of global local mixing wants to um, encode. So you can formulate uh, uh, the definition of global local mixing for uh, 
a, a general measure, infinite measure preserving system, but uh, I will specialize it only for uh, maps of the real line because uh, the, def the general definition is a bit more technical and uh, it's not really relevant for what I want to talk about today. So <clears throat> I will say that uh, a map on the, the real line which preserves an infinite absolutely continuous measure is global local mixing if the following happens. So I will call any function in L1 a local observable and these in some sense are my uh, initial probability distributions which I want to study the evolution. And I would call a global observable any, any function in L infinity uh, such that when I take the average of my observable over a large interval, uh, the sequence I get by taking larger and larger intervals converges to something that I will call the, the average of phi, so the, or, or the infinite volume average of phi. Uh, so examples of global observables are periodic functions where the average value is just the integral uh, over a period, or for example, functions that have a limit when you go to infinity are, are global observables. And um, so if the discussion I, I uh, outlined before, well, keeping in mind that discussion, hopefully the, the following definition um, seem uh, appropriate. So a map T, the map T is said to be global local mixing if for any pair of global and local observables, the correlations between the two will converge to the product of the average of the global observable times the integral of the local observable. And again, the, the, the idea one should keep in mind is that um, this means that when I evolve my initial probability density under the dynamics, this, even if you start with something very localized, it will spread over the phase space and we'll see larger and larger portions of the phase space uh, and give kind of a uniform mass to uh, these large uh, boxes. So I hope this makes sense. And uh, if you have questions, please feel free to stop me. <coughs> okay, I take you up on that invitation. Yeah. Um, so I just, just, I think a question of definition of infinite ergodic uh, uh, theory here. I like, I have a very limited understanding of it, but my, I know it from Pomo Mendel maps when you actually, when the measure is not uh, defined, becomes infinite. So how does it yeah. relate to this? Because then this would not work, right? You wouldn't have a sign L1 of mu and so forth. So how does this relate to those systems? So, and how sorry. does, sorry, yep. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so you, you would, in for global local mixing, you are trying to, to pair a local observables, which is something which has a finite integral for whatever your measure is, with uh, another observable that can have a, is just bounded like in L infinity, so it might have an infinite integral, but um, you, you, you want to say that on large finite uh, measure portions of your phase space as an average, and when you take the limit over a family of sets that exhausts your phase space, uh, this limit converges to a to a value which you call the average of the uh, of the global observable. So in the case of, uh, say, maps of the interval uh, with uh, an indifferent fixed points that preserves an infinite measure, you would say you would call a local observables any function in L1 and global observables any bounded function such that when you take the average over an interval that is far away from zero but approaches zero, this converges to a to a finite value, to a value that you call the average of, uh, of your observable. Okay. Thanks, so I can see how it now relates to those yeah. more mental yeah. maps. So, yeah. so the definition is more general, I'm just stating it for uh, the, the yeah. class of systems that I'm interested in today, yeah. but yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. No problem. So this is the, the notion of mixing for infinite system that I want to address, I want to study. And uh, the systems are indeed uh, skew products. So for example, for, for now, let's take uh, skew products over, uh, or extensions over the cat map with R fibers. Uh, 
and uh, the measure is the product measure, so it's an infinite measure. And uh, we take the functions to, to have zero average, just to make sure that the system is recurrent and ergodic. And, and we consider uh, these Q products. So just for notation, for a pair of global and local observables, I will call the, the covariance between pi and psi as the integral of the product of the two functions, which is well-defined since this is in an infinity and this is in L1, minus the product of the average value of phi times the integral of psi. And so it's easy to see that uh, for a global observables, then phi composed with the skew product is again a global observable and the average is invariant. So asking about uh, uh, global local mixing amount to verify that uh, the, the correlations, so the covariance between phi composed with fn and psi go to zero. So the, the main results are uh, some quantitative estimates for global local mixing. And um, so our results, uh, again, joint work with Paolo Giulietti and Andy Hammerlindl, um, says that in this case, uh, says that for a generic set of tau, we have the following uh, estimates that, um, of course, depends on the, the global observables you, you consider. So I'll state for the moment uh, two, two examples that uh, I hope will clarify that um, they, they can have a very different behavior. So if as local observables you take any smooth compactly supported function and as global observables you take any say sufficiently smooth function such that on all our fibers the function is periodic then you have rapid mixing. So again, for every positive integer k, the, the correlations can be bounded by a constant that depends on k on the observables and times n to the minus k. And this is what we would expect from Dolgo Piazza's result. On the other hand, if you consider instead the function, so as local observables, we take again uh, smooth compactly supported functions, but imagine that as global observables, we take functions such that on each R fiber, they have a limit and up to subtract the limit, you can think of that the limit is zero. So you take functions that vanish at infinity and sufficiently fast. So here W1 is the sobble space of functions in L2 that have a weak derivative that is again in L2. Then for, and, and the dependence when you move along the fibers is Lipschitz with respect to the norm in W1 then you can show that for every epsilon, the, the correlations can be bounded by C times N to the, to a negative, to, to, to a power that is fixed. So uh, minus one over two P plus epsilon. And uh, it's, it's easy to come up with some examples of functions of this form such that you can get a lower bound of the, the same form as the, uh, right hand side without the epsilon. So um, you cannot get, uh, you don't, you actually have genuine polynomial global local mixing. So you have, uh, you can prove quantitative estimates and uh, these estimates depend uh, heavily on the, observ the global observables you consider. So um, now I will uh, describe the result in generality and uh, uh, hopefully, it will also clarify where this difference comes from. So, um, if there are no questions on this part, I'll uh, um, start uh, describing the <coughs> result in, genera in full generality. Okay. So, <coughs> so I will uh, again describe the general setting and. So we'll describe the, the systems, we look at the main assumptions that we have on the systems and the classes, of the families of global and local observables that we consider so that then we can state the, the result and in whatever time is remaining, I will give some ideas of the proof. So the systems are skew products over a one a topologically mixing two-sided subshift of finite type. Uh, with the usual distance, 
and let's measure on, on the base dynamics, you can take any Gibbs measure sorry, with respect to uh, all their potential. And on the fiber, you, you translate by a Lipschitz function that you take it with zero average. So these are the systems uh, we, we consider. And uh, just for notation, I will call f the space of Lipschitz function uh, over sigma. Um, the, the measure on, on the skew product uh, will be the product measure. So the Gibbs measure times the Lebesgue measures on R. And I will denote by fn the Birkhoff sums of f. So what is the main assumption on, on the systems uh, is what is called accessibility. So let me explain what it is. So for any point uh, xr, I will call the strong stable set as at xr as the set of all points whose future orbits uh, gets very close exponentially fast to the future of xr. And uh, in a similar way, you define the unstable set of at xr as the set of points whose past evolution uh, gets very close to the past of xr at uh, an exponential rate. So explicitly, uh, you, can, you can characterize the points uh, in the stable sets. Uh, in the stable sets, so you, you can see that uh, ys belongs to the stable set at xr if and only if uh, from a certain point on the future coordinates at y are the same as uh, the one at x. And uh, the difference between S and R can be written as the limit of the difference of the Birkhoff sum of F at X and Y. And you have a similar statement for the unstable set. So uh, the unstable set here, you, you have the past, so you replace greater or equal with less or equal. And here you have the backward Birkhoff sum. So instead you would have Fn of sigma minus N of X minus Fn of sigma minus N of Y. Uh, so what would be important for, for later is to remember that um, the difference of the Birkhoff sum uh, at x and y uh, describe the, the vertical displacement of the stable sets and unstable set. So we will call an SU path any finite sequence of points, xi, ri, such that uh, any points belong to either the stable or the unstable set of the previous point. And we will say that the system is accessible if you can join, if there is an SU path between any two points. So if you can go from any point to any other point by following stable and unstable sets. And this is uh, the main assumption that we put on our skew products. So from now on, I will assume that the skew product is accessible. And I will now describe the classes of global and local observables that we consider. So uh, the, again, the, the more delicate objects are the global observables. So let me tell you what they are for, for us. <clears throat> so eta is a complex measure on R, any complex measure on R. So if, if you want, you can think of, you take any measurable complex valued function and eta would be given by integrating this uh, this complex uh, valued function. Uh, the variation of a complex measure is uh, the positive measure. Um, well, it's defined in this way. In the previous example, would be the positive measure given by integrating the absolute value of, uh, of the function you chose. And uh, a complex measure is total variation. So the total variation would be uh, just the, the variation of R. So in the previous in the case I was saying, uh, would be just the L1 norm of the function G if it exists. So we would consider complex uh, measure with finite total variations. And when you have such a measure, you can take its Fourier stiltis transform. So the, the Fourier uh, stiltis transform is defined in, uh, analogously as you would define the Fourier transform for um, L2 functions, for, for Schwarz functions, say. And uh, what you get is a function in L infinity. And the collection of all Fourier transform of uh, uh, measures with total, with finite total variation is, a, is an algebra function that is called the Fourier stiltis algebra. 
And uh, if you keep it with uh, the norm coming from the total variation, so the norm of a Fourier transform is the total variation of the original measure, then it's a Banach algebra. So maybe some examples. So what are elements of this algebra A? Well, Schwarz functions are in the Fourier stilts algebra. Indeed, uh, the Fourier transform is inverted on the space of the Schwarz function. So any Schwarz function is the Fourier transform of a absolutely continuous measure with uh, Schwarz density. The Sobolev space W1 that I was uh, mentioning before, so the space of L2 functions that have a weak derivative in L2. Uh, indeed, any element, any function in here is the Fourier transform of a function in L1 intersection L2. Lipschitz periodic functions are in A. Uh, this comes from the theory of Fourier, Fourier series. So any Lipschitz periodic function can be written as the Fourier transform of a discrete measure. But then, of course, you can have many more uh, examples. So just for curiosity, you can take an infinite product of cosine functions where you rescale that in each factor by a power of a fixed uh, integer between 0 and 1. And uh, this is uh, a Fourier stiltis transform. And uh, indeed, uh, for example, for lambda less than 1 half, uh, these are uh, Fourier transform of uh, singular continuous measure. So all these cases were either uh, Fourier transform of absolutely continuous or discrete measures. But of course, you can have all the mixed cases in between, so singular continuous or any combination of these. So you also have a characterization, uh, but it may be not very explicit, but anyway. So any uh, element in A can be written as a linear combination of uh, continuous positive definite functions. This is uh, all theorem by Bochner. Uh, although it's not very easy to, to check that uh, if a function is uh, positive definite, there are uh, plenty of criteria uh, or sufficient conditions to decide whether a function is positive definite. And perhaps the, the, the key fact for us is that any uh, element, uh, any, any such element has automatically a average as I was describing before. So any function that is the Fourier stiltis transform of a measure with total variation has a infinite volume limit when you take averages of a larger and larger box. And the value of, the value of this limit is just the mass that, that, that the original measure was putting at zero. So in some sense, uh, this quantity is also a natural uh, quantity to look at. And um, uh, yeah. So uh, what are the global and local observables that, uh, that uh, we consider? Well, uh, local observables we take as local observables, we take Lipschitz function from sigma to uh, the space of Schwarz functions. So uh, Schwarz function is a Fréchet space defined by a family of seminorms. So when I say a Lipschitz function, I mean a function that is Lipschitz with respect to all of these seminorms, possibly with different constants. And the space of global observables, we take all Lipschitz function from sigma to the Fourier stiltis algebra. Uh, so to be completely honest, there is a additional, uh, we, we require an additional condition for global observables, which is uh, probably only technical, but um, so in particular is satisfied. So for any fixed x, phi of x is an element in A. So it's a linear combination of continuous positive definite functions. This technical condition is automatically satisfied if you take the function to be Lipschitz as well. And by the key fact I was uh, mentioning before, any element of G is a global observable in the sense of the definition I, I said at the beginning. And the average of the of the phi is uh, the average of the mass that all the measures uh, on each fiber put at zero. So I will always uh, called eta x, the measure whose Fourier transform is phi of x. 
as a last definition, I will, for a given global observable, I will call LF of phi, the, the function on that to each r associates the, 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 the mass that the variation eta x put on the interval minus r r minus zero integrated over sigma. So this is just to uh, keep here the definition I gave in the previous slide. So what is the main result that, uh, that we proved? Well, if you take a accessible skew product as before, then for any local observables as before and for any global observable, um, and for any k and for every epsilon, you can find the constant such that you can bound the correlations uh, with this, the constant times the sum of two terms. Uh, one of them is super polynomial, and the other one depends on the behavior of the uh, measure associated to our global observables in a small neighborhood, small neighborhood near zero. So, uh, in particular, um, you can say that if the if your global observable has the property that for any fixed x, the associated measures uh, have support which does not in intersect a neighborhood of zero. So if zero is an isolated point in the support of this measure, so suggestively you can think if the global observable has a spectral gap, then the first term is zero because for n large enough, uh, this, this quantity here would be zero. And so the decay is super polynomial. And so this is the case of periodic observables because they are the Fourier transform of discrete measures that do not, do not accumulate near zero. However, in general, uh, this will not be the case. So the, this measure will have, uh, the, the support will accumulate near zero. And so you would have a polynomial bound. So the, you can imagine that the measure of this interval would, in, in many cases, be a power of, a negative power of n, and uh, the, the decay will will depend on uh, how this measure behaves in a neighborhood of zero. So this is uh, the result, and uh, so indeed, uh, th this were the difference between the two cases I was outlining before. So this would be the case of periodic uh, global observables, and this would be the cases of uh, observable, uh, global observables in W1. So, are there any questions? Okay. So I will uh, say something about the proof. Um, so, uh, the first step will be to reduce ourselves to the case of skew products of a one-sided uh, subshift of finite type. And this is kind of a standard reduction, but um, so first of all, I have to tell you what, uh, what happens of the accessibility property in the case for, for the two-sided subshift when I reduce to the one-sided case. So I'll just motivate with some pictures. So if the if your skew product is accessible, then for any point, you can reach any other point in the R fiber above him by moving along stable and unstable sets. So if I compose with a large uh, iterate of the large negative iterate of uh, the, the dynamics, then the, the displacement in the vertical direction will, will stay the same. The stable sets will get very long and the unstable set would get very short. So now I can uh, project on, on the space X where X is um, the space of one-sided sequences. So I forget about the past of the sequences in Sigma. And so what will happen is that my, my long uh, stable set now will be a, a sequence of points that will have the same future, so that after a large iterate of the dynamic will get mapped to the same point. And uh, the, the short unstable manifolds will be, again, points separated by a short distance. So, so uh, in the, the one-sided case, when I reduce, I can move from any point to any 
point in the fiber by following long uh, segments of stable sets, moving over a little bit, and then following other long segments of stable sets, and then I will be very close to any points I want along the R fiber. So if this uh, picture um, makes sense, uh, so this is the, the definition that we say uh, of a collapse, access, collapse accessibility. That is, that is the, what happens of the accessibility property once I reduce to the one-sided case. So uh, for any point and any vertical displacement, you can find a sequence, finite sequence of points such that uh, xi, yi, such that xi and yi at some point will be mapped to the same to the same point, so they belong to the same stable set. And from xi to from yi to xi plus one, uh, I have to move of an exponentially small distance. And uh, t, the vertical displacement, can be expressed as the the difference of the Birkhoff sums of the points in the same stable sets. And uh, Again, uh, as I mentioned, we, we do this because uh, we want to reduce to study the case of uh, skew products over one-sided subshifts, and the accessibility property of the original system uh, will translate to this collapse, collapsed accessibility for the one-sided skew product. And I won't uh, explain too much about how this reduction is done. It's uh, quite standard, although in our case, it comes with it has to be done with uh, with care. But anyway, so from now on, we will focus on the case of skew products over one-sided uh, subshifts. And the the standard tool in this kind of question is look at transfer operator. So I will call L the transfer operator associated to the base dynamics that you can write like this here. Uh, the function u is the potential associated to our Gibbs measure, and LF plus is the transfer operator associated to the skew products dynamics that you can you can write in this form. So we want to look at the correlations. Um, so the correlation between the global and the local observables can be written as the integral of our global observables times the nth iterate of the transfer operator applied to our local observables. And now for any fixed x, we remember that this function by assumption was the Fourier stiltis transform of the measure. So you can actually prove that you can uh, transfer the <laughs> Fourier transform on the side of the global observables. So you can prove that this term here can be written as the integral over x, and then for each fixed x as the integral of the Fourier transform of ln of psi integrated with respect to the measure eta x, whose Fourier transform is phi of x, averaged along x. So now we want to look at this term. So the Fourier transform of the transfer operator applied to our local observable. And we can actually rewrite this term in the following way. So phi uh, psi hat of psi is so psi hat is the for fixed x is the Fourier transform of psi. Recall that psi for each fixed x is a Schwarz function, so the Fourier transform is well defined. And by putting a little psi, I mean the function where you keep psi fixed and you vary x. So you can show that this is a Lipschitz function. So this is the operator L psi applied to this function here where xi is a twisted version of the transfer operator for the base dynamics. So um, xi is defined as the transfer operator on the base dynamics applied to your function multiplied by e to the minus i xi f. So this is the expression you get. And uh, actually, all I'm saying is that if this is the transfer operator associated to psi, when you take the Fourier transform, this distributes on the sum, and here you are translated by a phase, so you just get uh, multiplied by e to the minus i psi. So in, in conclusion, we have rewritten the correlation in, in this term. And 
now we want to look at the inner integral in this expression for different value of psi. So for psi equal to zero, uh, the twisted transfer operator is not twisted at all. It's just the transfer operator for the base dynamics. So the, the corresponding term, when I apply to the local observables, will converge to its integral. So the integral of psi hat at zero, which is just the integral of the original uh, observable psi. So the corresponding term will converge. So this term will converge to the average of the integral of psi. And if you recall before, this the integral of x of the measure um, eta x at zero is just the average value of our global observables. And this convergence happen exponentially fast. So that, that's good. And then for very low frequencies, so for psi uh, less than n to the minus one half plus epsilon, we just apply a trivial bound where the, the transfer operator term in normal infinity, we can always bound it uh, with a constant. And so what we are left, so the integral over this frequency is very close to zero, we just bound it with some constant that will depend on psi times the, the variation measure eta x, the integral of the variation measures eta x in this, uh, in this uh, set around zero. That's exactly the term that we call LF. So all the, the rest of the proof amounts to show that all the, the, the part you have left, uh, so the integral over all the frequencies larger than uh, this value here, uh, this term will decay rapidly, so it will decay faster than any given polynomial. So maybe I'll just uh, say a few more words but without uh, going into much details. So the, the rest of the proof again will split in two separate cases. We will consider separately low frequencies and high frequencies. And in the case of low frequencies, uh, you can see your twisted transfer operator as an analytic perturbation of the transfer operator on the base. And with this, uh, with this observation, you can use uh, some uh, classical uh, results on uh, analytic perturbation theory of linear, uh, operate, linear bounded operators in particular, since you know that the untwisted operator uh, is quasi compact and has a spectral gap. Uh, an analogous property carries out for small perturbations. So you can write your um, transfer operator as um, an eigenvalue times a projector plus uh, another operator with smaller spectral radius. And you can explicitly write, uh, what you can write what an approximation for this linear eigenvalue is. And uh, to cut short, uh, you, applying the, these formulas, you can, get the bound, so recall that now the frequencies are larger than n to the minus one half plus epsilon, so that the corresponding, the, the lambda psi to the n will be, uh, um, can be bounded by a term of the form e to the minus, uh, minus n to the two epsilon, so a rapidly decaying term. So we are happy with this. And now we have to consider high frequencies. So what happens for frequencies larger than the bound given by the analytic perturbation theorem. And uh, in this case, you need to uh, exploit the collapse accessibility properties to prove some cancellation. So again, uh, maybe without going into much details, we want to prove an estimate, uh, a bound on the norm of the twisted transfer operator. So we will consider a different norm. We consider a different norm instead of the theta norm. Uh, we consider another norm that is related, but the Lipschitz constant on the function is uh, rescaled by a term that is linear in the frequency. And this is done uh, so that the H norm of the twisted transfer operator is bounded by one. And we want to prove that up to taking some iterates of this operator of order the logarithm of psi, we see a contraction in the norm where instead of being bounded by one, it's bounded by one minus a term that is a negative power of psi. And this will be enough to guarantee that when we apply to our local observables, we see a rapidly uh, decaying term. 
And uh, in order to achieve this bound, we, we will uh, uh, use the collapse, collapse accessibility property. So um, maybe, uh, yeah, I will just say that in order to prove a bound of this form on the norm of the transfer operator, it's enough to control, to prove that there exists one point at which the, uh, the transfer operator satisfies a point where it's bound at one point. And then from this, you can deduce uh, an estimate on the norm of the operator. So we, we want to prove such an estimate at one point. And uh, the, the, the idea of the proof is just assuming that this bound does not, does not hold. Um, okay, maybe I'll skip. Assume that uh, a bound like this does not hold. So what does it mean? So the, the twisted transfer operator is just taking an average uh, of these terms where uh, the gn is the cocycle e to the un plus minus i to the xi fn. So if you see no cancellation, what does it mean? You're taking an average of complex numbers. So if there is no cancellation, it means that all the, uh, the arguments of the complex numbers are kind of similar. So the angle between all these complex numbers is very small. But the angle between these complex numbers is related to the different of the Birkhoff sums of f, different points in the pre-images of p. And if this angle is very small, it means that the, the difference of the Birkhoff sum is very small. But in the collapse accessibility property, if you remember the, the difference of the Birkhoff sums at different pre-images of p was controlling exactly the vertical displacement of the stable sets. And if the vertical displacement of the stable sets is very small, this contradicts the, the fact that by the collapse accessibility property, you can move along any point in the vertical fiber just by moving along uh, stable sets. So of course you have to make this uh, precise and quantitative and it's, uh, it requires some work, but uh, you can do this. And uh, with this way, you can prove that also for high frequencies you have cancellation and the corresponding term is rapidly decaying. And uh, that will conclude the proof. So I'll stop here and thank you very much. <laughs>